All right, so spatial images and visual images. Uh, people who have been blind since birth can do mental rotation and image scanning with response times that are proportional to the distance traveled. So when we see this kind of performance among people who have never seen the thing that they're image imagining in their heads, it makes us think, what's going on with this kind of spatial imagery? Is it maybe more motion imagery or body imagery imagery? Maybe it's just abstract and it doesn't really have, we, maybe we're relying, those of us who are sighted are relying on vision, but the truth is it doesn't have to be visual. Maybe it could be, you know, in the absence of vision, maybe you're relying on what your body would feel like if you traveled that far or something like that. Um, so it makes researchers wonder what, what is it that we're looking at, right? If you give people visual tasks, so like imagine a cat, versus a spatial task, like memorize this map and then imagine moving within it, we see different brain areas getting activated as it, as it processes these kinds of stimuli. Um, we've found that people who have had like a stroke that affects their visual reason, region does not necessarily, does not necessarily mean that they have any kind of harm to their spatial imagery capability. Um, and vice versa. So clearly spatial is different from visual. They seem to be housed in different parts of the brain. Here's a um, colorization where anything that's blue is seemingly visual processing areas and anything that is yellow is spatial processing areas. And so you can see they're not even overlapping in the brain. They're very distinct areas. You know, the blue is more in the occipital lobe in the back of the brain, and the yellow is more above that and into what we call the parietal area, more on the top of the brain. Um, so very different locations for this kind of information. Um, there's a case study in our textbook about patient AL who had brain, I just said AL, that's interesting. <laughs> I'm looking right at it, it's LH, sorry, um, brain damage following a car accident. Um, and while LH had difficulty judging things like what color that is or um, other kinds of visual appearance based things, like whether it's, it looks shaggy or smooth or what these kinds of things, um, they had a lot of difficulty with those kinds of things, but they didn't have any difficulty imagining that object rotated or imagining how long it would take to traverse that map. Um, so clearly these are separate areas and they do separate things. So when we talk about individual differences in imagery, you might be talking about different, you know, brain areas being activated in people different ways, right? Um, so... I don't know why I'm getting these weird flashes when I click things. The choice between visual imagery and spatial imagery will be influenced by the task that's being performed, personal preference, and then individual ability. Um, you know, like I said, some people lack the capacity for visualization. We actually call that aphantasia. Um, and so a person, when given a prompt that could be a visual prompt or could be treated in a more spatial way, um, there are these factors that contribute to how they decide whether to treat this input as a visual input or a spatial input. So here's an example of what we're talking about as far as how it manifests itself. Um, so we have different participants, um, particip participants one through eight, and they're rainbow colored. And then this graph shows you how participants one through eight actually responded to um, different kinds of stimuli. And so we have the relative fMRI signal in the visual cortex, and then we have the time it took for the response. And um, what you see is that they, the important part isn't necessarily to know exactly what this graph is supposed to be depicting. What you should be getting though, is that every single person, each one of these four, eight people, oh, there's one overlap, um, are very different from each other. Actually, if you look right here in the middle, you can see this turquoise one, participant number six, is actually overlapping exactly participant number five. 
and then we have a little separation of the two of them and then they're back so we have two people out of eight who are performing virtually identically and then we have a lot of similarity between um, participant two which is the orange one here and participant three which is the yellow one here um, they look pretty similar and they start to from um, basically 15 seconds on start to look a lot like participant one so i mean there is some similarities i shouldn't say it's completely different but i mean you have like three of your participants that show um, greater fmri signal at 10 seconds and you have five people who are showing less fmri signal at 10 seconds right like that's what i'm talking about there's distinct individual differences and the idea is that based on the prompt you know what the task is what the natural style is for this individual um, they're going to approach the task through the route that makes the most sense for them and so when we see greater activity in the visual cortex that probably means that these folks are approaching the, the task as a visual task and when we see this especially these three down here this reduction in um, fmri signal in the visual cortex that kind of implies maybe they're approaching it as a spatial thing and these ones in the middle are sort of like kind of spatial kind of visual um, so kind of interesting right and then um, here again we have the amount of signal in the visual cortex the more vivid the image se seems to the person or is reported by the person the less relative visual cortex activity that's going on which is kind of an interesting opposite thing that you might think about right um, you would think that your visual cortex would be really active if you perceive the stimulus your image of the stimulus to be very vivid but it turns out that it's inverted like that so um, i guess the takeaway on this is that what might seem like a completely obvious visual or spatial um, task could be seen by the participant in the opposite way and could be processed by them differently and that might help to account why for why people um, describe their experiences with imagery and with spatial tasks differently from each other so why do we care why does it matter whether you have vivid imagery or not you know what's the difference well, I'm going to put in the playlist this video about aphantasia and um, explaining, you know, that we don't all have the same abilities um, with regard to that. Here, you stop. Um, so that'll be in your playlist. Um, vivid imagery might have a whole range of different kinds of consequences. Um, for one thing, strong visual imagers may be more likely to succeed in the arts. Might be. Um, some very successful artists report themselves to be aphantasia people that they really don't visualize much in their minds but they put it all onto the paper like they just and when it, when you're asked well how do you draw it if you can't visualize it they don't they don't know how um so it's not necessarily the case in fact our textbook has a couple of um animation artists who report that they really don't hold strong visual images in their minds at all. So it's not going to be a perfect correlation between being a strong visual imager and then being more successful in the arts. But on average, people who are better at the arts tend to be people who can visualize the world more accurately in such a way that they can depict it in the in especially artistic renderings. Um, strong spatial imagery might be better suited to a career in science or in engineering where you have to visualize the relationships between things and um, imagine, imagine engineering for example you definitely need some spatial imagery right you have to imagine um, you know the structures and you have to imagine how the components are going to interact with each other um, what this component might look like rotated. I mean, these are things that are really super important in engineering and in different fields of science. Um, imagine if you had really poor spatial imagery capability and you're looking through a microscope and when you first um, look at the microscopic object, let's say it's a um, bacteria, you see it from a different angle than you've seen it before and you go, well, this must be an entirely new type of bacteria this one's never been described before and it's like well just turn it over oh there it is okay yeah that's the normal one um you can imagine that that might be a, a a hindrance to not have very good spatial abilities in certain ways right um people with more vivid Im imagery tend to experience stronger emotions um and so it may be in general a sort of more um 
the word that's coming to my mind is sort of like empathetic, um, you know, being able to internalize things more accurately when you're a vivid imager. Um, non-imagers may feel less able to rele relive their memories. So non-imagers may have, remember back when we talked about autobiographical facts versus autobiographical memories? Non-imagers may have a quicker trans translation from autobiographical memory to autobiographical fact, where they start to just tell the facts of the thing that happens without the, all the emotion and detail and all that stuff that you might normally expect, expect from a memory. Uh, all right, so spatial skills. Mental rotation, which we've already talked about, and then this new thing that I wanna talk about called mental folding rely on different mechanisms. Success at mental rotation does not necessarily mean that you are going to be successful at mental folding and vice versa. We have found very consistently that there are sex differences in mental rotation where males tend to be faster at mental rotation than females do. Um, but we don't see those sex differences in mental folding. So it kind of suggests that this is a different kind of mechanism. So what am I talking about with mental folding? Um, so you're pr provided with a prompt and you're supposed to say whether taking this, they all are going to make a cube. So let's imagine you cut around the outside of the blue structure and then you folded along the lines, making a cube. Would the heads of the arrows touch each other? And just spoiler alert, the ones on the top will not. And the ones that say match along the row, the bottom row, those will fold. And here's a, a nice hint down here in the bottom right where they already are pointing at each other. That's a good sign they're probably going to touch each other. Um, anytime they're directly adjacent to each other, they're going to touch each other. So you see that on two of them. Um, this one's a little harder to visualize, right? Because you have to imagine folding along this line, folding along this line, fold this one in, and then you'd find that those arrows are actually touching each other. Mental folding is harder in a lot of ways than mental rotation because you really have to hold a lot of things in your mind simultaneously with mental folding. Whereas with mental rotation, you can kind of imagine rotating and then go back and compare to the original and then imagine rotating and go back and compare to the original. Um, so this one's considered a little bit more challenging. And uh, like I said, we don't have the sex differences and being good at one of them does not mean that you're going to be good at the other one. All right, let's go ahead and stop and we'll, uh, I think we'll be able to wrap up in the next video talking about some of these different imagery factors and how they're helpful or harmful for memory. So I'll talk to you again later.